Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So the section of God's Word that we'll be looking at this morning is our Gospel lesson. We heard it from John chapter 3. Uh, we'll hear once again just the opening two verses uh, where Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And so far, God's word. So if there were a way to get out of paying taxes, uh, how many of you would be interested in that? <laughs> a way to get out of paying taxes. All right, so a lot of you raised your hand. Some of you didn't, but I know you were thinking it, right? That's about what I figured. While we may see taxes as our civic duty and as a good and necessary thing to do for the functioning of society. I haven't met a single person who with joy looks at their pay stub and at the amount that the government takes out of it for taxes. And if there was a way that we could get out of that, we would, especially if it was legal, right? Now, it's been said that taxes are one of the two big certainties of life. The other big certainty is death. Now, what if there was a way to get out of that other certainty? Would you be interested in that? Now, I do want to be clear as I, as I bring up that idea. I'm not talking about just getting older and older and older and, and, and with that age, actually aging and aging and aging and aging and aging and, and just living on. I think that would be pretty, pretty hard life to live. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is living forever at whatever you define your peak health age to be. 25, so you're 25 forever. 35, so you're 35 forever. 45, so you're 45 forever. So what does that mean? Well, it means no aging, which means no wrinkles, which means no aches or pains, which means no need for surgeries, no failing hearing or failing eyesight, no gray or thinning hair, no need for all those uncomfortable exams that we all have to get as we get older and older in life. And instead of that all, just being able to jump and run and dance and sing and play and to wake up the next morning and not hurt. Does that sound like something you'd be interested in? Just life. I think it's something we're all interested in. Well, that's the kind of life that Jesus came to bring. Jesus called it eternal life. Life that's free from death. That's the life that he describes, life in the age to come. Now, in this Bible section of John chapter 3, uh, Jesus really digs into not necessarily the topic of eternal life, but more into how it is that it's possible and how it is that we receive it. And as we dig into this, what we'll see is that through it all, Jesus is on our side as our only Savior. Now, as we think about the topic of eternal life, maybe the first question that comes to our mind is, well, why do we need something like that? Or why would we want something like that? And if you think about it in terms of looking out at the world that we live in, I don't think anyone would deny that there's a lot of things wrong in our world, that our, that our world is broken in many ways. I mean, we see it. Uh, we see the, the rude way that people talk to one another behind the anonymity of the internet. We see poverty and starvation in, in several places around the world and including several places in our own backyard. We see wars and we see conflict every day, seemingly everywhere you go in the world. But as big as all those things are, the biggest thing I believe that screams there's something wrong with this world is death. As much as we may tell ourselves that ah, death is just a fact of life, it's natural, it happens, it's so on, there's still something that feels radically unnatural when someone you're close to dies. Something that tells you this should not be, this should not be happening, it's not supposed to be this way. And so you put it all together and you see that, that our world is full of broken now, brokenness. Now one thing that the Bible does is it, is it looks at all the brokenness in the world, all the different things that we see, and it says all those things, as bad as they are, they're only just a symptom. They're a symptom of a deeper problem, a symptom of a deeper brokenness. And that deeper brokenness is the one that comes from us trying to live without God. Or to put it another way, us trying to live as though you and I or any created thing is the highest authority and the most important thing in our lives. You see, anytime that happens, anytime we live as though you know, we are the center of the universe, death and destruction are introduced. Death and destruction are the result. And this Bible section brings it up using a couple of words, the words perish and condemnation. Now, you hear those two words, they're not really nice words, are they? Uh, they're not pleasant sounding, 
Uh, perish has the idea of being wiped out, of being destroyed. Uh, and so the question with that word is, do you believe human beings are capable of destroying ourselves and destroying our world? Probably agree with that statement. Uh, the idea of being condemned is being found guilty in court and sentenced accordingly. Well, if we destroy ourselves and destroy our world, is condemnation worthy of that? Yeah. The ultimate sentence then is death forever. So my question is, if you're a parent, how do you deal with it when one of your kids messes up really badly? It depends on how old your child is, right? If they're young, all right, you handle it one way. If they're an adult, you handle it a different way. But how do you deal with it when, your child, when one of your children messes up severely? Well, if they're young, you probably do uh, hand out some kind of consequence, but at the same time, uh, do you kick your child out of your life forever, no matter how old they are? No, as a parent, you continue to stand by them, right? You stand with them. You, you say, I know you messed up, but, but I want to help you through it. I want to support you, and I'm going to be there through you, even though you made this big mistake. Well, that's what parents do. So what does a God who made us and a God who made our world do when we mess up that world? Well, in the same way, he's there to help. He's there to provide a way out of that mess that we made. And that's what Jesus is there for. That's what he came to do. And so that's what he's describing here. He connects what he's going to do uh, to, to deliver us from this mess of the world that we made. And he does so in this conversation that he's having by connecting it with an event in his nation's history. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, uh, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. He's talking about an, an event in their past that went like this. Uh, about 1,500 years prior to this, uh, God had led his people out of Egypt uh, under the direction of Moses. Well, and during that time between when they left Egypt and when they arrived in the land that God had promised them, there was this period of time where they traveled through the wilderness for 40 years. Now during those 40 years of traveling through the wilderness, every day God made sure they had food to eat. And every day God made sure they had water to drink, that they were well provided for. And yet, what did the people do? Well, they complained. You're not giving us enough. You're not giving us good enough. We're tired of the stuff you're giving us, God. And, and so as a result of that, poisonous snakes came into their camp. Well, as those poisonous snakes bit people and, and, and so on, well, the people cried out to God and to Moses, deliver us. Deliver us from these snakes. And so here was God's solution to that problem. He said, Moses, I want you to make a snake out of bronze, and I want you to put that snake up on a pole and then anybody who's bit by one of those poisonous snakes can, can just look up at that bronze snake on a pole. And if they do that, they're not going to die, but they're going to live. Now think about that as a solution to a problem of snake bites. I would say it sounds a little bit unconventional, doesn't it? I mean, couldn't God have just said, snakes, go away? Or couldn't God have just sent down from heaven an antidote? So if you get bit, you know, drink this special water that, that God made. But God didn't do that. And so, well, why did he do this way? I don't have the answer to all those questions, but perhaps the best answer is that God wanted the people to know that it was he who was bringing them the healing and then to simply trust in him that he was going to keep his promise. And so Jesus' point here with what's going to happen to him, he say, all right, so what happened with that snake? I'm going to be doing something similar. Just like that snake was lifted up, so I'm going to be lifted up. I'm going to be lifted up on a cross. And on that cross... Jesus was going to take all of the results that come from our living without him. That is to say, he was going to perish, but he was going to perish in our place. That he was going to die and be condemned, but he was going to be under our condemnation. You see, on that cross, all the sin, all the guilt, all of our living without God, all of it was placed upon Jesus, and he died. And now, because he died in our place, in his place, we get to have life. We get to have eternal life. Now we might look at that and say, well, that's kind of a strange way to deal with all the wickedness and evil in the world. Wouldn't it be better if God just kind of gave everyone, you know, a big list of rules to say you've got to follow these and this is how you're going to be kind, this is how you need to treat one another? Or wouldn't it be better if God just got rid of all the people who cause all the conflict and destruction in the world? Again, the best answer for all of that is to say that God wanted us to know that he's the one who heals us uh, of our sin and to simply trust in him to keep that promise. See, Jesus came to bring eternal life and he would bring that eternal life uh, by dying in our place, by being lifted up on a cross. Now, the next question that probably comes is why would Jesus do something like that? 
Why would he come? Why would he let himself die on a cross to, to save people? Uh, the answer to that is found in probably one of the best known verses in all the Bible. Uh, John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So you look at that verse, the reason that Jesus did that, the reason that Jesus let it all happen was simply love. It was God's love. And what does God's love look like? Well, God's love looks like giving his one and only son. And so to get the fullness of what that means, that God gave his son, uh, what we really need to do is we need to take, to take a step back into ancient culture. See, in ancient culture, sons were everything, especially, especially the firstborn son, especially if that firstborn son was the only son. See, all the hopes, all the dreams of the whole family, they all rested on the shoulders of that firstborn son because that firstborn son was the heir. In that culture, it wasn't all about storing up possessions and making sure you have lots of things so that you can retire comfortably. In that culture, it was all about passing on your family to the next generation. So the most important thing that any family could have was not a car or a house or a cow or anything like that. It was a son. And so then, that son was the rightful possessor of everything that the father had. That son was the rightful possessor of everything that belonged to the whole family. And so also a father would regard his son's life as more precious and more valuable than his own. And so when we say God so loved the world that he sent his son, what that means then is that we can't think of God sending his son as passing the buck somehow or you know, making Jesus pay for this instead of himself. No, sending his son was the way for God to pay. It was the way. And so then when we think of God paying, well, a question that comes up is, well, how do you know what, what we're worth? How do you know what something is worth? Um, well, I have at my home a, a classic Nintendo entertainment system. It was given to me when I was a boy, probably about eight years old. You know, the one that came with Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt with it, a lot of you are nodding. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I still have it. It still works. Well, how much is that worth? It's worth whatever somebody will pay for it, right? By the way, I'm not selling it. I'm hanging on to that thing. But based on this truth, when you look at Jesus and what he did, how much are you worth to God? You're worth absolutely everything to him. You are infinitely important to him, infinitely valuable to him because that's what he gave up so that you could have eternal life. Now a question that often gets asked, well if God loved the world and if his love was so great then, then why is it that Jesus had to die? Couldn't there have been another way? And couldn't God just forgive? Well to understand why Jesus had to die we have to understand something about God. The way the Bible talks about God is that he is on one hand absolutely holy, absolutely just, but that he is at the very same time absolutely loving. 100% holy, 100% just, and 100% loving. Now we often have a tough time reconciling those two and tend to overemphasize one at the expense of the other. Uh, ancient people had no problem understanding that the gods as they talked about them were holy. That's why they were always afraid about, well, if we offend the gods, then they're not going to send rain or, or they're going to destroy our crops and so on. They got, that God, that, that God's, they got the holiness aspect of it. But what they didn't understand was that God could be loving and forgiving. Now, you look at our society, we're kind of the opposite. We, we have no problem understanding that God can forgive and that God can love. Uh, a loving God is something that, that everyone just accepts in our society. But what we struggle to wrap our minds around is the fact that God is holy uh, and just. And so we need to remember that God is both. He is infinitely holy and infinitely loving at the exact same time. Now, being infinitely holy and infinitely loving means that he has two desires that to us seem a little bit, a little bit conflicting. In his holiness and justice, he has a desire to punish sin. But in his love, he has a desire at the very same time, just as strong, to save the sinner. And so to fail to do either one would make him either less than holy or less than loving. And so only in a Jesus who dies for us do we see a God who is both fully just and at the very same time fully loving. And that's why Jesus had to die to bring us eternal life. And so a follow-up question to that, particularly if someone is interested in this eternal life that Jesus came to bring is, well, who is this for? Who can have this eternal life? Who does he want to give it to? Uh, twice in this section, it makes it very plain that he wants to give this to the whole world. Uh, as John 3.16 says, God so loved 
not this group of people or that group of people, but he loved the world. And then the very next verse says that Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Now the world, don't think too hard, is a vastly inclusive term. Who does the world mean? It means everyone. It means that there is no one, not a single person in the whole world who God does not want. This means then that there is nothing so bad, so wicked, so evil, so heinous in your past or even in your future that could make God say, you know, everyone but him or everyone but her. No, it's for the world. That means everyone, every race, every people, every time, every place. And if it's for the world, if it's for everyone, then you can all be certain of one thing, that it's for you because you're a part of the world. And so God so loved the world, he sent Jesus to, to save us from, from sin and to bring us eternal life. Well, then how does this work of Jesus become mine? Uh, the word that I think repeated the most in this section uh, was the word believe. Uh, it comes to those who believe in him. The blessings of Jesus come to those who believe. Now, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Uh, to believe in Jesus is more than just believing that he was a real person. It's more than just knowing a few facts about him. Yeah, like Jesus was a guy, he lived in Palestine about 2,000 years ago. People say he died on a cross uh, and that he, he rose again. No, it's more than just knowing those kind of things. To believe in Jesus is, yeah, it is to know something. It's to know what he did and to know why he did it. It's also to, to accept that as true. And then finally, it's to stake your life upon that truth. That's basically what happened when the people with Moses looked upon that bronze snake on a pole and lived. See, what did they do when they looked, looked up to that snake? Well, they were believing. They were believing that God would save them through just looking at their stake and they staked their life on it. It's not like they looked up at that bronze snake and said, yeah, give me some medicine at the same time. Uh, they, they just looked up at the bronze snake and believed that God would heal them. Uh, and so that's exactly what John is calling people to do uh, in this section of his gospel account. He's calling us, he's calling people to believe in Jesus. That is, he's calling us to, to look at everything that Jesus was done. And not just to say, yeah, Jesus did that, but to look at it and, and to learn why it was done. To accept it as truth and then to base your life upon that truth. Now we might wonder, why does he talk in such black and white terms throughout this whole section? You know, perish, life, condemned, saved, and so on. Well, well, he does that, first of all, because it's the reality. It very much is a black or white thing. But he also does that because he wants to call you and I off the fence. Now don't think about this too hard, but if you sit on a fence for too long, it gets pretty uncomfortable, doesn't it? You can only do it for so long. And so he wants to call us off the fence. Now in what way are we on the fence? Lots of people, if you ask them, do you believe in Jesus Christ, what are they going to say? Maybe the most hardened atheist will say no. Most people will say yes. But then, after saying yes, go on and live their lives as if believing in Jesus is virtually the same as believing that Abraham Lincoln was our 16th president. That's sitting on the fence. It's believing in Jesus or saying we believe on one hand and yet living as though our life is not staked to him at all. And so what John is doing here by telling us to, or by calling us to believe, he's just calling us all off the fence. Calling us to fully believe in Jesus as our only savior, that is to have our life staked to him both now and forever. And so John knows that there are people who believe and there are people who eventually don't believe or people who struggle with that idea of believing or struggle with the idea of having their whole life staked to Jesus forever. And so if we find ourselves ever struggling with that, uh, toward the end of this section, what he's doing is calling us to question our motives. At the end, he talks about people staying away from Jesus, withdrawing from Jesus out of fear, fear that their deeds would be exposed. You see, in that in that world, in his day, there were a lot of people who staked their life on religion, who put on a good show of being good and godly people. Their life then was staked on being morally and religiously superior than, than everyone else. So I go to church, I do good things, uh, and therefore they feared having the reality of their sin exposed. That is, they feared everyone else finding out, hey, those guys are just like me. Because if that happened, then they lose their power, they lose their authority, they lose their influence. Now they wouldn't openly admit that, but Jesus could see into their hearts and he knew that that was the truth. And so in the same way, when we're afraid to believe in Jesus, when we're afraid to have our whole life staked to him, we can come up with some good sounding reasons to stay away from him. You know, things like, you know those Christians have done a lot of things, a lot of terrible things throughout all history, right? I mean, the Inquisition, that was pretty bad. Uh, burning people at the stake, that was pretty bad. 
Uh, we can say things like, well, I, I have a tough time believing a book, but I believe something that I can see, so if Jesus is real, I want to see him myself. Or there are many paths to God. Uh, how can Jesus say that he is the only one? And there's lots of other questions, lots of other statements we can raise uh, as a reason to stay away from Jesus. But what I've seen often happens is that a lot of those questions can be answered pretty logically and pretty clearly and scripturally, and yet what always follows it is just another question. Well, if I answer this reason, then I have another one. If you answer that reason, then I have another one, and another one, and another one, uh, and so on. And so what John wants us to do is to ask ourselves, what is the reason beneath the reason? What's the reason underneath all of my reasons for keeping Jesus away? Oftentimes, it's a matter of authority. Now, there was a, an, actually an atheist philosopher. His name was Tom Nagel. Tom Nagel said this. He said, it's not just that I don't believe in God and, and hope I'm right. I hope there is no God. I don't want a universe like that. And then later on in the same passage, he went on to call it a, a cosmic authority problem. Now what he's describing is, is just that if there is a God, it's a recognition that, that he's subject to that God, that that God is in authority over him and that he owes that God his allegiance and his worship and so on. And he says, I don't believe in God uh, and I don't want there to be a God because if there is a God, then I have to obey him. And so, there's a similar principle that we can think through when, when we want to stay away from Jesus. You see, if, if my life is staked to Jesus, then, then I'm not in charge anymore of my life. Then I'm not the one in authority, but then I'm also accountable to him for the choices that we make. Now, if you think through that, giving up authority, no one's really neutral about that. No one wants to sign their life over to somebody else. There's, some, you know, there's something scary about... Uh, you know, when you sign the closing documents on your house and take out the mortgage, you're basically signing a good chunk of your life for the next 30 years over to this bank because you're going to be paying for it. Nobody is objective about that. Nobody is neutral about that. We're always hesitant. We always want to refuse. And so what John's calling us to do is to question our motives. Why am I staying away? Am I staying away because I'm afraid of authority or I'm afraid of losing authority? Question our motives. And then look, look once more at Jesus. Uh, how can you know that Jesus is not out to exploit you? How can you know that he's not out there to put you under his iron fist and to control you every minute of your life? How can you be certain of that? See, someone who just saves you from death, they might save you from death for selfish reasons. I'm going to save this person and now I got him and now they owe me their life. But when you look at how Jesus saved you, he saved you by laying down his life by being lifted up upon a cross from you. What, what do you know, what are you certain of regarding a person who says to you, your life is more important to me than my life? You're certain that that person cares about you. You're certain that that person is, is in it for what's good for you and not for himself. And see, Jesus did all of that. He saved you, he laid down his life, he died and rose again. He did it all, not out of guilt, not out of obligation, not out of shame, not because he was forced, but he did it all by choice. He did it all out of love. He did it all because he wanted you to have eternal life, that life when you can run and jump and dance and play and, and never wake up sore the next morning. So you look at all that Jesus has done for you so that you can live with him forever, and it tells you that he is indeed on your side as your only savior. So just believe in him. Just believe in him. Amen.